Welcome travelers, this is the Baseball Time Machine. Today's journey is our most tragic one yet. In Major League Baseball's 150 plus year history, there has only been one death caused by on-field actions. Cleveland's Ray Chapman passed away after taking a Carl Mays fastball to the head, and although this took place over 100 years ago, it's had lasting effects on our game. This story is one of misfortune, outrage, and eventually, innovation. How so? Let's step into the portal and find out. To properly tell this devastating tale, we must first set the scene. The year is 1920. Cleveland Indians shortstop Ray Chapman is in his eighth full big league season. He considered retiring before the season, but decided to play at least one more year to help his friend and Indians manager, Tris Speaker, win Cleveland their first pennant. Chapman, 29, was having one of the best seasons of his career. He entered what would be his final full day on earth, batting 304 with 97 runs scored, 27 doubles, and 45 RBI. As for the Indians, they were doing well as a unit, tied with the Chicago White Sox for first place in the American League. Closely trailing them were their opponents for August 16, the New York Yankees. It was a gray and dreary day as just over 21,000 piled into the polo grounds for the 3 p.m. game. Starting on the mound for the Yankees was Carl Mays, an unpopular figure known best for his unique pitching style. He was an extreme submarine pitcher, with his knuckles grazing the dirt beneath him at times. It had been referred to as a cross between an octopus and a bowler, with hitters not being able to pick up on the motion until the late innings, when the game was just about over. Mays had experienced success on the MLB level, having two 21 seasons previously, and was on the way to his third as he entered the game with an 18-8 record. On the mound for Cleveland was Stan Kovaleski. Kovaleski matched Mays in quality, also having two previous 20-win seasons and 18 wins on the year, but threw with a traditional overhand style. His quirk was that he was one of 17 MLB pitchers still allowed to throw the spitball. The controversial pitch had been outlawed before the 1920 season, but since it was Stan's main pitch, he was allowed to keep it in his arsenal until he retired. Despite the dark clouds above, the game began without any drama. Cleveland struck first in the top of the second on a Steve O'Neill solo shot, giving them a 1-0 lead. They tacked on two more in the fourth thanks to an RBI fielder's choice and Kovaleski helping his own cause with a sacrifice fly. Set on creating distance in the AL, the Indians' confidence grew with a 3-0 lead. Ray Chapman led off the top of the fifth. This was his third trip to the plate, having recorded a sack bunt in the first and grounded into a double play in the third inning. As he stepped up on a 1-1 count, he crowded the plate, hunched over, awaiting the pitch. As the ball was released, Chapman's shift back from the plate never came. Instead, players and fans were hit with what some called an explosive sound, as May's 1-1 pitch came up and in, nailing the defenseless Chapman in the skull. Babe Ruth said it was audible where he stood out in right field. Sports writer Fred Lieb described it as a sickening thud, as he heard it from the press box behind home plate. Chapman immediately crumpled to his knees, his face contorted with blood streaming from his left ear. The ball struck Chapman so hard it bounced into fair territory. Mays, thinking he hit the bat, tossed the ball to Wally Pipp at first base to retire him. It was only when umpire Tom Connolly began frantically calling towards the stands for doctors that Mays realized what had happened. Player manager and close friend of Chapman, Tris Speaker, rushed to Chapman's side as doctors swarmed home plate. With the help of two doctors, one being a Yankees physician, Ray was able to sit up and eventually get to his feet. He began to walk under his own power towards the Indian's clubhouse, but being at the polo grounds, the clubhouse was over 500 feet away. He collapsed around second base and had to be carried the rest of the way by his teammates. Gloom fell over the ballpark, with players and fans unsure of how serious the injury was. Despite the uncertainty, the game continued on, with a pinch runner taking Chapman's place at first base. Babe and the boys threatened with a late rally, but it wasn't enough to prevent Cleveland from taking home a victory with the Indians prevailing 4-3 over the Yankees. To make it clear that there was no intent, Mays showed umpire Connolly the baseball, calling it a sailor. He claimed it got away from him due to the fact that the ball was in such rough shape. The previous summer, American League team owners had complained to league president Ben Johnson, claiming that umpires were running up expenses by throwing out too many balls unnecessarily. Johnson issued a notice to umpires, encouraging them to keep balls in the games as much as possible. Due to this notice, it wasn't uncommon to find balls scuffed, browned, and stained with tobacco juice. Following the game, Yankees manager Miller Huggins, who also happened to be a lawyer, took Mays to a nearby police station to file a report. While they were clearing legal obstacles, Ray Chapman was holding on by a threat. At St. Lawrence Hospital, he was preparing to undergo an operation. On Trish Speaker's authority, doctors operated, making a three-inch incision in the base of Ray's skull. 
They found a ruptured lateral sinus, skull fracture, and a concerning amount of clotted blood. In a desperate move, doctors removed a small piece of his skull in an attempt to try and reduce swelling. Kathleen Chapman, pregnant with their first child, was summoned to New York to be by her husband's side. Post-operation, Chapman rallied briefly, but ultimately, the work done wasn't enough to save him. He passed away early the next morning, just hours before Kathleen's arrival. Many emotions sprouted from this unfortunate event. Both players and fans expressed their sadness, mourning the beloved shortstop in unison. Many players were outraged, specifically with Carl Mays, the man who fired the fateful ball towards Chapman. Ball players from Boston, Washington, St. Louis, and Detroit, with superstar Ty Cobb of the Tigers leading the charge, demanded that Mays be banned from baseball. Several Indians players even warned Mays that he better not be seen in Cleveland again. However, Trish Speaker never felt outraged towards Mays. As Chapman's teammate, manager, and even best man at his wedding, he was traumatized from losing someone so close to him, but didn't give in to the rage so many others in the game were expressing. Trish understood that for the good of the game, negative feelings towards Carl Mays had to be suppressed. Although a tragedy like this hadn't happened before or since, it's an inherent risk that comes with the game. There's always a possibility that a pitch can get away, that it can be a sailor. Trish Speaker knew this, and he took a rational approach to the situation, despite losing a longtime friend. Mays never hid how he felt about his accidental actions, and it was undoubtedly the biggest regret of his life. Never once did he enter the game thinking it would end with a fatality. Ray Chapman's funeral was held three days later in Cleveland, with thousands flocking to Superior Avenue to pay their respects. AL President Ben Johnson, who attended the funeral, took no action against Mays. Mays was eventually exonerated of all wrongdoing by law enforcement as it was clear there was no intent. Following the event, Mays went into seclusion for about a week and a half, and did not accompany the Yankees when they traveled to Cleveland the following month for a three-game set. The game directly following the incident on the 17th was canceled, and the Indians would lose seven of their next nine following the death of their shortstop. Cleveland left fielder Jack Graney later expressed how tough it was to go out and play without their former friend and teammate. When Trish Speaker returned on the 22nd of August, he rallied his troops and got them back in line. Despite their hopelessness after Chapman's death, Cleveland went on to win 24 of their last 32 games, securing the American League pennant and earning their first trip to the World Series. In the Fall Classic, they'd defeat the Brooklyn Robins in seven games. In a season where Chapman returned with that same goal in mind, the Tribe made it happen. A World Series victory doesn't bring back a lost teammate, but it shows that they weren't playing for nothing. This one was for Ray. In the years following the 1920 season, Players dealt with the tragedy in different ways. Carl Mays, despite feeling immense guilt and regret over what happened, was eventually able to feel better about the situation. Some players never forgave Mays, and held him responsible for the death of Ray. When it came to player safety, unfortunately no major changes came directly from this fatal event, outside of baseballs being cycled better to minimize the occurrence of sailors. However, seeds were planted that would influence the future of the game. In 1907, over a decade before baseball's lone fatality, World Series champion and now Hall of Famer Roger Bresnahan created the first batting helmet after getting beamed in a game. He experimented with the Reach Pneumatic Head Protector, which was essentially a leather football helmet cut in half to protect the left side of a right-handed batter's head. It didn't really catch on, and Bresnahan actually made a bigger impact with shin guards, which aren't too different from the ones used by catchers in the present day. Despite catcher's gear being used in at least some capacity by the 1890s and 1900s, batting helmets wouldn't be required for another 60 plus years. In Major League Baseball, the 1941 Brooklyn Dodgers were the first team to officially use batting helmets. Following the beanings of Joe Medwick and Pee Wee Reese, Hall of Fame general manager Larry McPhail made the entire team wear protective helmets. These helmets were based on jockey caps and resembled a normal cap but with a hard liner added in. It would be another 30 years until Major League Baseball made these helmets mandatory. Even then, there were some exceptions, with players such as Norm Cash and Bob Montgomery continuing to wear the cloth caps with lining, but only with permission under a grandfather clause. It wasn't until 1983 when MLB stepped up their game, requiring players to wear helmets with ear flaps. Of course, another grandfather clause was implemented, but this was still a step in the right direction. In 2013, the league introduced a new model of helmet, the Rawlings S100 Pro Comp, which was shown to withstand the impact of a 100 mile per hour fastball. The helmets used previously were only tested to 68 miles per hour, a speed easily exceeded by players. Crazy, right? These helmets were made mandatory throughout the major leagues, and are the same ones we see in the game today. Many players have even taken an extra step to protect themselves in recent years, adding cheek protectors to their helmets. 
After seeing the damage done to someone like Giancarlo Stanton back in 2014, it's better safe than sorry. Either way, it's encouraging to see how far baseball has come in terms of player safety. The death of Ray Chapman is by far the most tragic event in MLB history. Having someone pass away from playing our national pastime could be quite jarring. Although it took a few decades, Major League Baseball did learn from it, and players are now far safer because of it. Nevertheless, Cleveland lost a teammate and a friend in the wake of Ray Chapman's death. Kathleen lost a husband, and their children lost a father. Those who knew Chapman raved about his cheerfulness and enthusiasm about the game he loved so dearly. They praised his storytelling, his love for the performing arts, and his dedication to the sport of baseball. They say it's just a game, but I guess sometimes, baseball could be life or death. This has been the Baseball Time Machine. Thanks for traveling with us. We here at Baseball Time Machine appreciate you spending time with us. To honor our recent journey, crack these codes for a chance to win a mystery. To honor our recent journey. Safe travels.